your intro. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Savannah. Um, Alex and I are the admins for the Facebook group Healthcare Professionals Investing in Real Estate. I am a registered nurse. I worked in a bunch of different specialties. Uh, most recently, I was in an administration role um, at a hospital here in LA, and I just stepped down into a per diem position because of my real estate investments. So um, I actually did my first full day training today in a pre-op. So um, now I have the flexibility to choose the cleanest area of the hospital to work. And so it's just been such a great transition in that um, I invest, I started investing in single family homes. And then really quickly after I learned about multifamily and the ability to sell and use other people's money and to create a larger portfolio with a lot less risk involved in multifamily with pretty good rewards, a lot, a lot higher returns than I was making in single family homes. So I uh, went through a coaching mentorship program for that, closed on three apartment complexes in our first year, and we're actively submitting offers now for our next one. Um, and yeah, I'd really just uh, love networking, uh, I have a brand net worth nurse with my business partner, Kai, who's on the call and really just motivated to share different wealth building strategies through real estate investing and other investing with nurses and other healthcare professionals. I think there's a huge, huge lack of that information out there, a huge gap and really just motivated to provide resources. And that was a huge motivating factor for Alex and I in starting this group. Alex, you can go ahead. Hey, how's everyone uh, doing? Thank you for joining us. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. My name is Alex Sabio. I live here in Southern California. If you guys could do me a favor, click on your name, click on the three dots here on the corner and change your, rename yourself and put what city you're from. We want to see where everyone's from. Um, I'm actually um, a respiratory therapist by trade. I've been doing that since 2002. I've uh, been investing in real estate since the mid 2000s, made a ton of mistakes along the way. And now I invest in luxury short-term rentals and I self-manage them for a distance. And it's been amazing for us. We're actually closing in on our third short-term rental uh, tomorrow, no, Wednesday, we, we sign documents Wednesday. Um, and now my passion is to help others invest into the same space. So that's kind of why uh, we brought Jeff here. Jeff, uh, I'm really excited to have him here. He, Jeff, he's a lender and he's an expert when it comes to lending for short-term rentals. Uh, he's been originating residential mortgage loans for about 15 years now. And he is a top 1% originator in the U.S., Super excited to have him here. Jeff, how's it going, man? It is going great. I am super excited to be with you guys. Hey, hey pleasure is ours here. Thank you, for, uh, thank you for doing this for us. So many people um, ask me a question on, you know, how much money you're putting down and how you acquire a vacation home. And they're surprised when they hear, you know, you could get it at you know, just putting 10% down. So that kind of opened up the doors for me. Initially, I was looking at $250,000, $300,000 um, um, homes. And then when I could go up to five, six, seven hundred thousand dollars $700,000, it was like, oh, and these make so much more money, you know? Yeah, a lot, a lot of great opportunities. And it's like a lot of other things in life. Knowledge is power. And uh, when we can get in power, we can go out there and do significant things. So I, I'm excited to, to share something that potentially could uh, change the course of, of where someone's going today. So that, that's a great opportunity. Thanks. Um, let's see. Do you have, are you able to share your screen at all? Do you have um, something here? Multi one person spoke. Sure. Okay. Um, so Jeff, where are you? Tell us your background. Uh, what is it that you do? Well, first of all, I've been the husband of Valerie for 25 years. So that's that's like the number one deal. And then uh, second to that is I'm the dad to, to four kids, Jace, Callie, uh, David, and Caleb, and now a father-in-law to, to Cassie. Uh, you guys are, are very near and dear to my heart. My oldest uh, got his EMT right out of high school, went through fire academy, uh, got his paramedics. So he's a uh, EMT firefighter uh, paramedic and then my 18 year old is going to school and she wants to be a, 
uh, a PA. So excited to be here uh, with this group of people. But yeah, what we've been um, doing for a while now is helping people buy second home or buy properties, vacation properties with these second home occupancy loans, and then educating people on how friendly Fannie Mae is when it comes to uh, people wanting to rent these out on a short-term basis. So uh, my story in this, in this world, in this space started when we, you know, we, we got to a point in our lives where uh, we were, uh, we had surplus, we had excess, we were very blessed. And, you know, we were always in the, you know, cut from the cloth, of, you know, if, if you can save enough, you can save enough, you can go out there and do things. And um, so we were in, in that, uh, that group of people where we had saved enough, we were ready to go do something with it. Uh, stock market wasn't exciting. Being a landlord, you know, wasn't real exciting for us, but we had been vacationing and utilizing short-term rentals for accommodations for our family. And we had played it, stayed in some really, uh, really cool places. So that's what led us to wanting to buy one of these properties. We ended up buying two of them and they've been, they've, uh, they've been doing really well. And so uh, not only do I come from the angle of, of having an extensive background in lending, uh, but also am an owner as well. I think that's so important because I think um, I get questions from people all the time. They're like, do we just go with uh a rocket mortgage or something like that, but you really want your lender to also have some short-term rental so they understand the product and everything. And I, 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 people are telling me, hey, you know, do we try to hide it or anything like that? I don't hide nothing. I want a lender and I want a partner that goes in and says, you know what, these are all the risk, you know? So I think that's the most important thing. Yeah, and I, I you know, I tell people all the time, Fannie Mae, uh, has really modernized their policy to reflect what's going on in the space. And for them, it makes sense to, to have someone who fully qualifies for the loan without any uh, consideration for future income from the property. Uh, and, you know, then they can supplement that, that ability with uh, renting these properties on a short-term basis without losing uh, the ability to do so, yeah, it's it's a no-brainer for them. It's it's a safe, pretty safe bet. Right, and you mentioned Fannie Mae. Like people say, you know, does it have to come from a local bank or something like that? Or you know, this is a, like a national product, right? You don't have to. Um, I mean, it's it's not really well known, but um, it's endorsed by Fannie Mae, and so yeah. It is. It, it's, uh, it is a Fannie Mae loan, and uh, that's the same type of loan that probably a lot of people have used to buy some type of residential uh, mortgage, like a primary residence. So it's fully qualifying uh, based on your personal income, uh, documentable income against your personal, personal consumer debt. And then, like I said, your ability to absorb that new PITI payment into your ratio and still be below Fannie's. But yeah, our biggest opportunity has come with uh, educating people with the correct uh, policy and then also having the correct interpretation of the policy uh, and then also vetting that out, uh, you know, doing a lot of deals coming across a lot of scenarios and situations where in some cases, you know, un we got pushed back from underwriting and we went directly to Fannie and they said, nope, that's okay. So, you know, it, it's, it's proven. Our, our understanding has been proven over time. All right. Awesome. So Jeff, what are some like, like walk the new investor through this, like, let's say I want to buy a loan or buy a vacation home so I could put 10% down. What are some of the myths that people have or what are some of the requirements? Yeah, no, that that's, and we can cover both of those because we'll cover some of the myths, the, you know, misunderstandings out there. And a lot of that has come from loan officers. And, and what I've seen is 
Um, someone will be excited about buying one of these properties. Maybe they talk to a friend, maybe they go back to their lender that they've used in the past and they use the word investment property or they use the word rental. Well, those are kind of some trigger words where uh, when a lender hears that, a loan officer hears that, they go directly to an investment property loan. So that's someone who's wanting to buy a property to get into a long-term lease agreement and they have no intention of occupying the property. So they go straight into, okay, well, you're going to need 20% down. You know, this is your interest rate. And um, yeah, it's not a road that you have to go down uh, if, and this is number one, when it comes to the policy, that your intention will be that you're going to occupy the property at some point during the year. Uh, so it's very vague. It's vague for a reason. And to your point earlier, you know, when uh, people have been doing this for a while, Fannie just really made that policy or that point of the policy vague because they didn't want to put people in a position where they felt like they were, you know, committing mortgage fraud. Um, so it, it's, you know, made it very wide open, very, um, uh, very liberal uh, in that regard. So that's intention. Uh, and then to just kind of summarize the, the second home occupancy rider, and that's your commitment and how you will occupy the property. Again, it states that you'll occupy the, the property at some point for your enjoyment. And then uh, really that you will not lose the ability to occupy that property in that way. So what that looks like is, is that you're not going to get into a long-term lease agreement where you'd have to go through some kind of legal battle. If you wanted to, to occupy the property, you know, no uh, timeshare uh, arrangements. So, so one of the myths is, is we hear you can't put it on Airbnb. You can't put it on Verbo. Uh, though that area right there, if you read the fine print in Verbo and Airbnb, it states that they are not facilitating a legal lease agreement. All they are are marketing sites that connect owners with guests. And so they're facilitating this arrangement where the guest would stay in the owner's property on a short-term basis. So you're not losing control over the ability to occupy that property. Uh, the other one that we hear is you can't have a property manager, which is false. Uh, the only reason that you couldn't have a property manager, and I've never seen this, is if their agreement uh, stated that you had to make the property available a certain amount of time per year. And if you did not, then you would be in breach of contract and they could sue you. So um, that, that just doesn't happen with, with property managers. So uh, that's some of the myths, some of the misunderstandings. Another one is distance. So there is no distance requirement. We've literally done deals where uh, the, the property was 20 miles away from someone's primary residence. So example of that may be someone who lives in a subdivided community and then 20 miles away, there's a lake, you know, a, a destination area where people like to go stay, vacation. And the explanation is, hey, we want to go buy a place out there on the lake. We've got a boat. Uh, we like to go out there with our family. We just like to have, you know, a place where we can stay from time to time. So no distance requirement. Um, you can only own one of these. Fannie Mae will allow you to have up to 10 properties in your name. And there's nothing that says that you can't use all 10 of those spots for second home occupancy loans. Um, it's got to be a one unit property. If you get into anything above that, two unit, three, four, that's an investment property loan. So it's got to be one unit, single family residence. Uh, Fannie Mae loves townhomes. And then uh, they like some condos. So uh, the condos have to meet certain requirements. So if you go to, down that road, you definitely want to talk to your lender about, um, you know, what is approvable by Fannie Mae, but if they have to meet certain requirements. And a lot of times your buyer's agent can be their best resource for that. Uh, and in fact, if anyone wants my buyer agent interview questions, uh, if they'll email me at jeff.chisholm at northpoint.com, I'll send those to you. Uh, but one of the things that I cover in there is uh, tell me your understanding of how people are using or what type of financing they're using, because I want to use a 10% down Fannie loan. What properties or what developments do I need to concentrate on 
if I'm interested in using that type of, of loan. And they should either tell you, okay, go here, here, and here, stay away from here, or I'm not sure I'll be able to, I'll, I'll find out for you, I'll research. So uh, yeah, email me, I'll send you those questions. They come from the perspective of an owner who's been down the, the same road, uh, someone who's dealt with realtors for a long time. So I want someone who will listen to me, uh, to my questions, answer my questions. And if they don't know their stuff, they'll be exposed pretty quick. We want to make sure we hitch ourselves to someone uh, that understands this asset class. And I saw repeat the email, Jeff, J-E-F-F dot Chisholm, C-H-I-S-U-M at North Point, N-O-R-T-H-P-O-I-N-T-E dot com. Hey, Jeff, you mentioned intent to occupy. I mean, do they, is there some type of, I mean, do they follow up or anything like that? Or, I mean, how would they ever know, right? Okay, so I've never heard of the Fannie Mae police. They, they may be out there. Um, they may have the servicer. So like North Point is a seller servicer. We go directly to Fannie. We do exactly what Fannie allows. We don't have a middleman but then we service the loan. So maybe there's a, a scenario where they have directives to the servicer. Hey, we want you to send someone out there to find out who's staying in the property. And if they knock on the door and you know it's not you there and they ask that person, hey, how'd you end up here? Well, I signed a lease agreement for the next year to stay in this property. There may be a problem, but if they you know, said, well, we found this property on Airbnb, they, they would say, hey, no problem. Enjoy yourself. Have fun. Jeff, what are some of the biggest differences between these kind of loans and a loan on, a, on a, an investment property? So, for example, I bought my single family homes over in Atlanta, Georgia at the beginning of 2020, and I got like a five a high four interest rate i think it was like 4.5 and i've heard that these loans are drastically lower you're exactly right and that's a great great question so it's all about intent so uh, the investment property loans if we go over a single unit then you would have to do investment property uh, an investment property loan so if we say single unit, and then it goes to intent to proceed. So those properties in Atlanta, Georgia, Georgia, the only way that you would be able to do those using a second home occupancy loan is if your intent was that you plan on occupying those properties at some point during the year. Now, uh, one thing that is very liberal about Fannie versus Freddie. So when I originate a loan and we're direct for Fannie or Freddie, I can choose which one I go, go with. And when I do a second home occupancy loan, I go with Fannie because in their writer, it states that you're only uh, committing yourself to occupy the property and, and uh, meet these commitments for the first year. So after that first year, if you wanted to lease it out on a long-term basis, they would be fine with that. The other thing that I would mention about that year time frame is Fannie will allow you to transfer title into the name of an LLC after you've owned the property for a year. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, to, I get that all the time. Do, do we own it in an LLC or not? And I always tell people, I don't think you could buy a LLC can buy a vacation home because that's an entity, right? versus an individual person. Yeah, that's exactly right with Fannie. Now, a little bit later, we can talk about DSCR loans and North Point announced this week that we can uh, originate those in the name of an LLC. So loan is in the name of the LLC and title vesting day one is in, in the name of the LLC. Oh, wow. That's a game changer there. And the one thing I, I, I look at it, like I don't know why like a lot of lenders because short-term rentals is there there's so much cash flow in them right and uh, to me if I was a lender it seems safer because they generate so much more cash flow um, and you would think that a lot more lenders would be doing it 
but it seems like it's kind of this special niche. Well, it is. And uh, I, I'm going to uh, run this as long as I can. And I, I really think that I'll be here for a long, long time. Uh, so great opportunity. And, and I think our best days are ahead of us when it comes to, to short-term rentals. Hey, uh, Jeff, another um, thing, I've heard you talk about like the bigger and better thing, because I, I've, I've he heard, um, like I own in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, but um, you can only have one in that same region. But I've heard you talk about like getting something bigger and better. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, I, I don't know about your property in Pigeon Forge, but let's say it was a two one. So two bedroom, one bath, um, you know, in the woods, nice setting. Uh, you drive up, it's a little hard to get down to the property, uh, but, it, but it's a nice place and you love the area. So a year later, uh, you decide, hey, this property, uh, we can't ever have extended family there. You know, we'd really like something where we drive up and we can just walk you know, straight to the, the front door without, you know, someone falling down a hill. And then, you know, we walk out on this deck and it's got this amazing view. So that's, that's an example of what bigger and better would be. So again, it comes back to making sense to an underwriter that, uh, or why you would be using another second home occupancy loan to buy real estate in an area where you already own real estate. Now you would, you wouldn't be able to do it again. It, it, it would be, you know, uh, then, you know, on a third property, it would appear that you're trying to build a rental portfolio in a, in a, uh, the same destination area. What if I like refinance out of a vacation home loan, right? Like, let's say I did purchase it as a vacation home loan, but now I'm cashing some money out, but then, I mean, do, do they look back and say, oh, you don't have a vacation home loan under your belt? Yeah, it's, it's not really about the loan product. It's, it's more about uh, owning the property and then the intent of the loan product. So, yeah, they, they just don't want this product to be abused in a way where people would try to use it intentionally to build a rental portfolio. Now, it, we buy in these different destination areas using that that product ultimately that's what we're doing but it's still in the spirit of the loan product and its intention or its its policy which is your intention will be that you'll occupy the property at some point but it's also interesting that they release you from that commitment after a year so you know i don't know how this will evolve you know, it, it's been great to see how they they have evolved this product over the past couple of years, uh, because even as recent as March, they added a little footnote. And it was because these were these uh, scenarios were becoming common where you would get the contract and the contract would say that, you know, all the the. Uh, the furniture and everything was conveying, which that's not uncommon, but then they were adding the future bookings would convey and underwriters were going, Hey, wait a minute. What is this? This sounds like a rental property. And Fannie Mae said, uh, even, even if it is discovered that it is a, a short-term rental, uh, that loan is still deliverable to Fannie Mae. It is sellable at Fannie Mae. So yeah, a lot of things that, you know, I, I really think that we may see in the future that Fannie Mae says that they will consider uh, proposed or future income from the property and qualifying. Um, I said, I foresee it. So no one send me a, a note saying, hey, I heard you say this, because that isn't the case on the Fannie Mae loan where they will consider the future income. Hi, Jeff. Hey, thanks uh, for doing this great information. But I had a question. How do you know if it's uh, Fannie or Freddie? Well, you have to ask your lender. Um, 
with which product they're going with. Uh, and if they can't tell you, you, you may want to move to someone who can because Freddie doesn't release you from that, that occupancy requirement. So they, they do not say in their rider that, you know, after a year you're released from, you know, using this for personal use and moving on to, you know, whatever you choose to do with the property. And well, good question. Because uh, a lot of times, some of my uh, long-term rentals, when I refi, they'll transfer the loan to another company. Um, can you kind of get screwed over that way if you're originally thinking, oh, this company I'm refinancing through or getting a loan through is through uh, Fannie Mae, and then they transfer that loan and it ends up going to someone who's doing a Freddie Mac? No, that, and that's a good question too. So that's just the servicing aspect of it. That doesn't change the, the loan product or, you know, who, who actually holds the note. So, um, yeah, like I said earlier, North Point is a seller servicer. So that means we sell our loans to Fannie and Freddie, but then they pay us to service the loan. Now, there can be times where uh, North Point may decide we're going to sell off a portion of our servicing to Nation Star, you know, one of these big servicers. That doesn't, that just changed who your servicing is done by. It doesn't change who actually holds the note. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, you guys, um, if you start to have questions for Jeff, you can go ahead and either just drop them in the chat or you can put yourself off mute or raise your hand. Um, it's We really want it to be open and engaging. So if he's talking and a question pops up, yes, please, please ask it. Um, Jeff, is there a loan limit to be able to put 10% down? Yeah, there is. And, and we have seen the biggest uh, loan limit increase in the history of, of mortgages. So uh, here about two weeks ago, they went up for most areas, went up to 625,000 from 548,250. So, you know, that put us in a place where 10% down, that raised our maximum purchase price up to 695,000, uh, which, which is a drastic increase. And then with uh, North Point, and one of the, the big reasons why I'm with the bank is we have pretty extensive menu of portfolio products. One of those is a piggyback second. So we can add a second loan to the first up to 250,000. So with the 10% down, that puts us at a max purchase price of 970,000. Got it, awesome. It looks like uh, Deepika has a question. Hey, can you explain that one more time? That sounds so, I'm so sorry for bumping. But my God, that sounds so, so, so good. Please, can you explain that one more time? He just broke the, the Facebook group, so. Yeah. <laughs> and you're, uh, you're talking about the loan amount? Yeah, the, the piggybacking you just mentioned? Yeah, so you probably heard of like an 80-10-10 loan where someone's trying to avoid mortgage insurance. So they'll put 10% down or, or 5% down. And that second lien is a 15% loan. So we're, we're doing something very similar, but we're working with the conforming loan limit. So in that first, first lien, we're going to max out the conforming loan limit, which is what Fannie Mae will loan up to. So it's their maximum loan amount. And for 2022, but it's already in place, we can, we can go ahead and originate uh, those size loans are up to that loan limit. Uh, that first lien position is going to be at 625000 So the second lien position, we can do at, at North Point up to 250000 And then you have your 10% down payment. So your combined loan to value is still 90%. Does that help at all? Sounds like you got to buy something worth a million bucks, Lenny. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to leave anything on the table. You max it out. Absolutely. Yeah, you already know where my head is going. All right. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. <laughs> hey, hey, Jeff, so just to piggyback on that. Um, so the piggyback loan, will, how much higher will the interest rate be versus your original loan? 
It is. So I can't quote exact interest rates. But yeah, it's just like range be, wise. Yeah, it's going to be about one and a half percent higher than the first lien. Got it. Got it. All right. Thank you. Yep. Um, hi, Jeff. This is Deepika. So we recently closed with North Point in June for a short term, uh, for a second home, and our intent was to use a short term. Uh, um, but we signed a paper that said that we will occupy this property and we will not get any rental income from it. And then when I questioned the lender, and we work with North Point in Washington, and uh, when I questioned the lender, he said, well, these documents are pretty old documents. And at that point when they were created, you know, vacation rentals or income from vacation rentals was not a thing. So what they really mean is just long-term. So you, so as a condition for a second home, you occupy this property and not get any long-term rents out of that. So does that mean that short-term rental income is still okay when we sign these papers? Yeah, it, it is. And when, when did you close? June, June of this year. That is very interesting because, yeah, the Fannie Mae short-term rider, as it stands today, came out, I, I want to say February of this year, maybe even a little bit sooner, maybe even December of last year. And then Freddie updated their rider because uh, they used to share the same one, and it, it did say that you couldn't rent it out. Um, but uh, they split, and they, they wrote their own. Fanny came up with theirs. Freddie came out with theirs, and I believe theirs came out like March or April of this year. But uh, that's interesting that they would have had you sign an old writer. Um, but if you want to email me, I can check on that for you. But not, and, and I'll tell you this, I get it all the time. I've talked to this loan officer, even within the same company mm -hmm. uh, is a, a great example. But um, yeah, there, there's just, and a few years ago, I came across, you know, we, whatever profession you're in, you get inundated with emails personally and professionally. And a few years ago, I just happened to open up an email that talked about Fannie Mae changing the uh, requirements and the policy on their second home occupancy rider. And what I read was very interesting and, and to me seemed pretty significant. And sure enough, as, as time went on, it, it developed into something that really has, has changed the space. Okay. So, so basically now Fannie Mae has a new rider that will allow short-term income, a short-term rental income, but still not allow LTRs for about a year, correct? A year, that's correct, yep. Okay, sounds good, yep. thank you. You're welcome. And I'll, I'll, one thing I'll say about the long-term rental is, um, you know, Airbnb came out with data uh, about three weeks ago, I'm sorry, three months ago, two months ago, and they've been on a pretty consistent run rate where 20% of their bookings have been for 30 days or more. So, you know, we, you know, that's pretty indicative of a big population of, of digital nomads, traveling nurses, traveling surgeons uh, that, you know, they can work and go and, and live in other places in the country and they'll stay there for two months. So, you know, that is a, a, a huge opportunity that we have in this space. And we can take advantage of those after we've owned the property for a year, because, you know, one thing that you have to look at is there's one thing that Fannie Mae says, but then there's also state laws. And a lot of state laws will say that once someone has occupied a property for 30 days, then they have tenant rights. And then, you know, there's the potential there that if someone overstayed their welcome, uh, they have these rights as a tenant in the state, and then all of a sudden you're in a legal battle. That's what Fannie Mae wants you to avoid, but we can we can take advantage of those after a year. Hi, Jeff. Um, I wanted to know regarding the loan, the original, the primary loan and also the piggyback loan, are those fixed interest rates? They are, yep. Awesome. And then... 
Um, did you mention earlier that you can have only one loan or up to 10, I'm sorry, only one property or up to 10 as long as they're justified, meaning different locations? Yeah, you can have up to 10 properties. Uh, I'm sorry, you can have up to 10 mortgages in your individual name. And then, you know, the other question I get is, isn't debt to income ratio a limitation at some point? Yes, absolutely. For, uh, for some people, if not a lot of people, if not all people. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, after a year uh, where you've documented and claimed that income on your taxes, uh, Fannie Mae says that you can use that income for qualifying. So, you know, potentially if you qualified for one, you wait a year um, or you collect, you know, 12 months of income, that's your strongest position when, when you're showing that income on your taxes. Uh, you can add, we can add back in depreciation. Um, so potentially the worst case scenario, you're going to wipe out that, that mortgage liability and free up space to do another one. So, you know, that's going to look different for everyone, but uh, if that first one maxes out your debt to income ratio, for example, you could potentially wait a year, uh, claim that income, and then use it to at least offset the liability. Awesome. Thanks for answering that. Um, yeah. Also regarding the, the maximums, did you say it was in one year you can move it to an LLC if you so decided to do that? That's correct. Yep. Awesome. Um, and then... If you, if one individual can have it, one individual can have up to 10 loans. If you're married, do you, suge do you suggest for the title to add your spouse, even though they're not on the loan or keep it completely separate or what? Yeah, they can. Yeah, they can be on title. That, that wouldn't be a problem uh, because the loan still, you know, they're, they're still not on the, the loan. So uh, they're, it's not going to be on their credit report. They're not going to be responsible for it, but uh, yeah, they can still be part of the, the ownership vesting. Wonderful. Thanks for answering the questions. Appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. Emmanuel Garcia from Phoenix. What's up, man? Hi, everyone. This is his wife. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm here, though. I'm right here, though. We're okay. Oh, All right. <laughs> <laughs> they're going to see your name and then they're going to hear a woman's voice. Um, so our question is, um, so we're allowed to have individually up to potentially 10 of these loans, right? Um, but does it depend on the lender? Like, are we both able to have 10 each? Like if we're married and my husband, Emmanuel, wants to have 10 and I want to have 10, is that a possible situation? It is. Yep. Absolutely. Um, and when we, if we were to go down that path, when we do kind of like the debt to income ratio or, or the lender does that analysis, um, is it like the household income or is it our individual income if we're applying by ourselves? Individual income. Yeah. So whoever's on the loan application. Okay. Thank you. That was our questions. Yeah, you're welcome. Alex, I hear Phoenix and it, uh, it fits in my model of I want 10 properties and my goal for those properties is uh, to, to chase 72 degrees into my old age. So uh, I, I can definitely foresee having a property in Phoenix one day. Does it, wait, does it ever get 72 degrees in Phoenix? No, it stays 110, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure that'll have its place. Too. <laughs> Anthony Chow, owner of Yay Chalet. Superstar Thanks. STR owner here. What's up, man? No, I'm just trying to make it work. Um, yeah, I had two questions for you, Jeff. I, I joined a little late, so my second question might have already been answered. So apologies in advance. But first is, when you place a property into service, is there a certain number of months that you look for as a lender in order to count for that first year? So if I close on a property uh, next week and I place it into service let's say late November or early December, would that count on a tax return as one year or is that too short? Oh, it would. Yeah, the only thing that you lose there is the amount of income from those missed months. So, you know, you could show, uh, 
yeah, those two months on 2021, but it's just not going to look very strong because it's only two months because it's going to be averaged. It's going to be averaged out over 12 months. Oh, so it doesn't. So let's say you go live in July and you make six months worth of income that would be counted over 12 months, not six. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right. Okay. I see. Okay. And then the, um, second question I had was one year move into LLC. So this applies to um, any short-term rental. Like if you have it for one year, even if you have the do on sale clause, you can move it into an LLC or am I misunderstanding? No. Yeah, you got it. Yeah. That, and that's one way that Fannie has modernized their policy to reflect what's going on in the market. Because you talk to investors that, that own long-term rentals uh, they do it all the time, right? They, even though Fannie Mae does not allow that, um, and, and I don't advise it as a, as a licensed loan officer, uh, but they knew that people were doing it. So again, it's one of those ways where, hey, let's, let's keep people away from potentially committing mortgage fraud or putting themselves in a situation where uh, they shouldn't be which you're right. If, if someone doesn't know the due on sale clause, it basically says if there's a change of ownership in the property, uh, which the servicer is, is um, given notification of that, then there's a, a document that you sign that they, that says that they can, uh, they can call the note. So, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't want to be in that situation, but, you know, ultimately Fannie Mae wants performing loans. So, you know, it, it hasn't been an issue in the past, but they want to make it where, hey, that's our policy. Got it. Makes sense. And the last question I had was around um, kind of like RSUs. So like, I don't know if you work with any tech folks, but for lenders, do you guys count RSUs toward um, prospective clients' income? That, that's a great question. Um, and I don't come across it very often. But I, I can research that. If you'll email me, I don't know if you got my email address earlier, jeff.chisholm at northpoint.com. I can research that and, and find out for you. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, you bet. Nadia, come off mute. Hi there. Hi, Jeff. Um, could you talk a little bit about construction loans? Sure. So, um, there, there's two kind of questions I get there. One is where you're buying a spec home from a builder uh, and you know they've carried the cost of the construction with their own bank. You can come in at, at North Point and do a 10% down loan to purchase you know, new construction. Now, if you're starting with lot and then you're finding a builder, the builder wants you to go out and find a construction loan, with North Point, you would have to put down 20%. Uh, we do lot loans and the lot equity day one would go towards that 20% uh, requirement of, of a down payment. There are other lenders out there that do 10% down construction loans, um, true, true construction loans. So there are some some lower down payment options out there. We just don't have them at North Point. Did that answer your question? Yes, it did. Um, and when you said there are lenders out there that do offer a lower down payment, are you talking in the context of a vacation home or are you, or something else or an investment loan? No, no, it is a second home occupancy loan where uh, it, and it's a fanny product uh, mm -hmm. where you can do as little as 10% down on a, a single closed construction loan. Got it. Yeah, I got one of those through Huntington um, recently, and I was looking at, at buying a second property in that same um, community, but I, I've run out of my vacation home loan, right? So, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So, yeah, You'd so it's just the options. Yeah. Yeah, you'd have to go investment property loan and, and Fannie Mae does not have a construction loan product for investment properties. So you'd have to find, you know, a, a local portfolio product more than likely. Got it. Or, or find a 
find a builder that that uh, would carry the construction cost. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. I had a follow up question to Nadia's construction one question. Um, so that let's say that you're in a partnership with someone and they're carrying the note. Um, and you're both on title. In future years, does that income count toward your debt to income ratio? For example, you know, profits split 50 50 to keep it simple. Um, when as a, as a lender, when you're looking at who's on title getting income, but they're not on the note, does that have you run into that situation and kind of how do you adjust for that? So they're on title. So they're an owner of the property. Uh, then yeah, you, you would just need a one year history of that short term rental income. Got it. Hey, Jeff, Wait, just, hey, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Ed. Sorry. No, I was just going to clarify. So let's say you have a one year of like 50% of the net profit. Would you have any debt against that property counted against you? No, right? Because like if someone ran a credit report, there would be yeah, no, no kinda, mortgage. It's yeah, kind of like a loophole. It's the, well, it's kind of the best of both worlds. Yeah. And it, it's the same way in, in um, you know, being on title, but not being on the loan, you have all the benefits of an owner without the liability. So yeah, you're exactly right. Got it. You need Thank to you. find a bunch. You need to find a bunch of those partnerships and then go buy your own. Yeah, <laughs> we'll see. Or, or use, or use. You know, your you go out to get the loan for the the properties. Yeah, after establishing some of those partnerships. Yeah. Got it. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah. Hey, Jeff. You touched on it a little bit earlier. Uh, regarding the DSCR loans, can you talk a little bit about that? Because I'm, I'm coming to the point where I'm, I need to look into a DSCR loan where my debt to income is pretty much like maxed out. Yeah, yeah, that's a great option for people that want to scale, but they've maxed out their, their uh, opportunity with Fannie Mae because of debt to income ratio uh, requirements. So uh, the DSCR loan is uh, not going to look at income at all. Uh, and, and when I mentioned earlier, you could do it in the name of an LLC, you still have to have a guarantor. So uh, we need that for the purposes of making sure that the member, the majority member of the LLC that's going to be the guarantor has good credit uh, and that they have a, a good payment history with uh, mortgage debt. So they're really looking just at, at those couple of things. And then beyond that, it's all about the property's ability to outperform the PITI payment. Um, so it's it's a great loan. And in this space, like you said earlier, uh, because these properties are cash flowing so much better than long-term rentals, uh, banks, and there there's all sorts of entities come into the game around this loan space um, because uh, it, it's it's become so popular. Uh, not only from a, a people wanting to own these types of properties, the lenders are also coming to the game as well. Now, uh, you have to have 20% down for that property. So there, there's more of a commitment from, from that standpoint, but it's a, a very easy loan to do. Jeff, can you dive in a little bit for people on the call who might not understand what a guarantor is? And you just said, credit and one other thing they're not looking look at liquidity and net worth or what else are they looking at for that Ex well yeah the unit size yeah, you, like length of time investing any of that you've got to have up to a four unit property uh they want in order to be able to do the 20 percent down you have to have owned at least one other investment property and that can be a short-term rental it could be a long-term rental uh, and that has to have been for at least a year. Um, so they're looking at, you've got to have, they've got to be able to source your funds for the 20% down payment. And then you have to have six months in, in reserves. 
uh, but they're looking at credit and then mortgage payment history. So they want to see that you've been responsible. You've got a good credit history of being responsible with credit. And then you also have a good uh, history of, of paying your mortgage on time. So they're not looking at net worth and liquidity or length of experience in real estate at all? You have to have, you have, to have at least one year as an okay. investor. So they do, we do allow new investors, but you have to put down 35%. You, you mentioned for that loan that, the, uh, that they're looking to see if, your, um, see if your property will clear PITI. Do they look at that specific property itself or are they looking, are you, do you mean a portfolio of these as a whole? Well, they're looking at, it, it's very similar to what they'll do on an investment property loan. So the appraiser is looking at market data for rental properties. So they, all, they look at long-term rental properties in the area uh, as comps. And then they're also looking at, in this case, short-term rental properties as comps. Uh, so that, that's, that subject property doesn't have to be currently uh, a short-term rental to qualify. Uh, you just, in, in most of these areas that we're dealing with in these destination areas, there are similar properties uh, already performing. Now, it does help when that property is currently a short-term rental and there is some data that we can use there. It just makes the approval a lot easier. Thank you. Jeff, do you see lending changing for short-term rentals? I mean, I know at a certain point there was like, um, I forget what the rule was, like 7% or something like that, where a lot of lenders only were allowing certain amount of their portfolio for short-term rentals. Yeah, I mean, that- like they got that, conservative at one point. They did. And, and uh, it, it was almost like someone said, really? <laughs> Are you sure we want to do that? And they, they overturned that. So they, they did away with those, those limitations. So um, I really don't see that Fannie Mae would go back to that other than they want to throttle back investors in the market that may be taking away from uh, people that are, that are needing to buy a primary residence. So um that that's the only reason I can think of other than, you know, we have something catastrophic happen in the economy and these loans don't perform well. Thanks. Uh, let me, let's look, I'm going to go over Savannah. You want to look over the Facebook group we'll see if there's any questions over there or if anyone else has any questions. Yeah, um, one just popped in. Do portfolio loans apply to short-term rentals or just other type types of investment properties? Other types, yeah. So investment properties, short-term rentals. Um, the other one to mention would be bank statement loans. So for anyone out there that has, you know, is self-employed, that they own their own business and they've been frustrated by their ability to be able to qualify for traditional type loans, we do have a bank statement loan. So those are going to be for people who uh, their tax returns, they write off what the law will allow and their, their tax returns don't actually reflect their true income, but their, their bank accounts would. So if you looked at their bank accounts, it would show that the cash flow would uh, equate to uh, a, a much higher income level. So We'll use anywhere from 12 to 24 months of bank statements to come up with a, a qualifying monthly uh, income amount. And then we'll go into an analysis on debt to income ratio from there. So um, that, that's good news. And we'll do it on second homes and we'll do it with 10% down up to $3 million. So it's, it's a really nice opportunity for uh, people that have been frustrated by their the the inability to qualify for more traditional financing. Okay. 
three million dollars wow okay <laughs> uh someone's asking can you refinance an investment loan into a dscr and change both title and loan to llc if so yes. will it come off your dti uh it will yep it's a great question uh do the answer whether there's creative financing with low down for properties greater than 970,000? I don't know if the question is there. Let me see. Uh, any other, anyone else with questions? I do. Is there a limit of how many um, DSCR loans you can have? There is with North Point. So, um, and this is something that I actually learned today. And, you know, this is a, some of this information is, is kind of evolving uh, because we just made the announcement on uh, Monday. What is today? Monday, today. <laughs> so, you know, this is very new. But what I found out today was, is you could have 10 Fannie properties, Fannie and Freddie uh, loans in your name. And then you could still do uh, five of these types of loans with North Point. So, uh, yeah, you, you potentially could have 15 properties uh, by utilizing or 15 loans utilizing this product. I guess that's a good problem to have once you get to that certain point, you know, I think people get stuck with, oh, man, I can only have 10. <laughs> Dude, just try to get one here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's start with one. Well, and I'll, I think that's a good, uh, a good segue into something that ends up being an aha moment for someone. So I mentioned earlier, you know, we were kind of cut from the cloth of, you know, just save, save, save. We got to save if we want to go out there and, and do something. And uh, over time, what I have come to understand as a, a great strategy is utilizing a HELOC for down payment, closing cost, and set up fees for a property. So, um, you know, whether that's on a primary residence or uh, at, at North Point, we can do HELOCs on primaries and second homes. So, you know, I'll talk to people quite a bit that are in the, in fact, had a conversation today about some, with someone that was in the middle of a cash out refinance to uh, get the money that they needed for that down payment closing costs and setup fees. And what I proposed to him and what I got him to think about was we're going out and buying a business. And so, you know, if, if we were going to go out and, you know, start a business, the, the best route would be we come up with a business plan, we take it to a banker and we use someone else's money to start that business instead of putting ourselves at personal financial risk. Uh, that could lead to bad places because we're going to exhaust our, all of our personal resources to, to start this business. So that's, that's one way that I help people kind of think about things that maybe they didn't in a way that they didn't think about them before is, yeah, these are fun properties. We're going to be able to go out there and make money on them. Well, they're actually businesses that we're buying. And so if we'll uh, use that static equity. So we've got to balance between uh, our personal debt and then using and leveraging things that are just sitting there. So we use that static equity in a HELOC for that down payment closing costs and setup fees. Instead, instead of tying our first mortgage lien with additional debt. And the other thing to think about is once you commit yourself to that higher PITI payment, on the first mortgage cash out, you're forever tied to that higher payment when you're calculating your debt to income ratio for future pur purchases. Whereas if you use the HELOC, we separate that debt, we make the property pay it back. And if we're getting the right deals, we can be pretty aggressive with paying that back. And we eliminate that payment from our debt to income ratio for future purchases. Was that like a fire hydrant explanation? <laughs> that would only decrease your debt to income if the HELOC was on a property that was under an LLC, right? Not under your personal name? Well, and that's the, the typical 
typical uh, scenario. So 90% of the clients I work with uh, are using a Fannie Mae loan and then the HELOC that they are going to leverage is on their primary residence. That wouldn't count towards their debt to income though. The HELOC is not considered like a loan that would be additional debt. It, it would, but the idea is that it's included on this one, but on the next one, uh, we're not. So in the case where you cash out on a first mortgage refinance, you're forever locked into that PITI payment, that higher PITI payment. So that was the pro point that I was presenting. But yeah, the HELOC would go against your debt to income ratio. Okay. And the other thing it. that I'll, I'm sorry, real quick, the other thing that I would mention about the HELOC and the reason I like it in this space is because uh, like your question earlier, what if it takes a couple of months to put the property in service, you're reducing your liability on a monthly basis because that HELOC is an interest only payment. So it gives you a little bit of reprieve until you get that property in service and you start getting some income from the property. Uh, Anthony, another question. Yeah, yeah. follow-up question on that uh, HELOC. Um, you mentioned on primary and second home. So for the second home uh, for North Point, what is your max LTV for the HELOC? Is it like 80%? 80%, yep. Got it. Um, uh, that, that, was, that was my only question. And in, in, in terms of pricing, is it like prime plus 1.75 or like something like that? Email me and I can send you some details. Got it. Thanks. If I hey. start talking rate, I have to read this whole disclaimer, disclosure, legalese. So we we don't we won't go there. I want to start wrapping it up because um, we're about an hour in right now. Um, Jeff, so much information there. Thank you so much for that. Um, all of it really. Um, and where can people get a hold of you? And one last question is, do you service all 50 states? Yes. Yeah, we service all 50 states. Yeah. Um, best way to reach me is through my website, 10percentdown.com. That's spelled out T-E-N percent, P-E-R-C-E-N-T down, D-O-W-N.com. So I've recently revamped that site to where uh, it, it's a little bit more consumer friendly. What I found was I could have 45 minute conversations with people and say the exact same thing over and over again. But really, uh, people want to go out there and consume information on their own. So you can go to the website. Uh, I ask a few questions to gather some information about what you're looking to do. And then I'll offer some videos to go through just some of the basics of uh, what you can do, loan structuring, product types. Uh, and then you can schedule a, a follow-up meeting. We can go over details about your scenario, or you can jump to the next step, which is to fill out an application to get pre-approved. So that's vacayhomefinancing.com. Uh, you'll fill out an application. My team follows up to schedule a review call with one of my uh, loan officers on my team. And our goal there is just to make sure we're dotting our I's, crossing our T's, looking under the bed in the closet for anything that we need to verify, clarify, have a further discussion on. Because once we tell a client that they're pre-approved, we don't want any surprises for anyone once, once they're under contract. So uh, it's important that we get that right. The other, and this is huge. I, I hear all the time, I can't win a deal because of multiple offers. I'm getting beat out by cash offers. We can go out there and we can be competitive using financing if we know how to do it. So um, first of all, we've got to have that pre-approval letter way in advance of going out to look at properties. You can't find the property that you love and then try to scramble to get a letter. The property will disappear. Uh, we also have a portal system we set up realtors with where they can generate a letter on demand. So again, we got to be quick. 
Uh, we've got to be fast in the process, but we also want you to be prepared. So we give you those numbers so you can analyze a deal quickly, but you feel like you're making a wise decision. But the, the point I want to get at is on that financing approval contingency to be able to compete with, with cash offers, we've got to be confident in your approval to the point where you can put zero days for uh, the financing approval contingency. All right. Wow. Thank you so much for that, Jeff. Awesome. Cool. Well, I will definitely post this up on YouTube and then I'll share it to the group because I know there was a lot, a lot of information in that. So that way you guys can go back, rewind, replay stuff and kind of hear some of those answers again. So thank you so much, Jeff. Um, you guys, the links are dropped in the chat. So if you want more information, uh, head to his website, his emails in there as well, reach out to him. Being able to service in all 50 states is so amazing. There's not a lot of lenders that do that. And that just provides so much value for any market that you're looking in. So you can um, have one point of contact and not have a bunch of different lenders for every single state that you're looking at rentals in. So huge value. Thank you so much, Jeff, for coming out. Alex, who do we have up next week? Is it Yona? Is it Yona? Uh, shoot, I should know this offhand, but... Uh... <laughs> oh, God, I put um, you on the spot. Um, I know. <laughs> We do not know who's up next week, but we have a guest already. It's in our <laughs> sheet somewhere. So um, either way, it's going to be an amazing guest. We'll post for it on Facebook, Instagram, um, some other ways for you guys to follow. We appreciate you guys all so much for coming out. We love the engagement in this group. There's always such amazing questions. Um, people are getting a lot out of it. So um, thank you guys again for coming and we will see you next week. Thank you, Jeff. My Thank pleasure. You. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Jeff. Take care. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Alex and Savannah, as well. Yes. Appreciate that a lot, Jeff. Yeah. Thank yeah. you guys for having me. That was awesome. Well, um, just let me know. We'll do follow up. Uh, uh, I'd, I'd love to visit again because. There's always something changing. So, it, and it's just getting better, which is yeah. awesome. We might be contacting you in the morning because we have a deal in Gulf Shores that we're working on that um, the lending's kind of falling through. It's a condo though. Um, so we'll see. My brother just yeah. texted me. He said, maybe we'll use this guy. <laughs> <Was that okay>? <laughs> <laughs> well, condos can be a different animal, but yeah. the, and, and it's not, I, I didn't touch on it, but if we can't do Fanny, then we have portfolio products that, that we can mm. use to do those non-warrantable condos and the yeah. condo tells. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. We thought it was uh, warrantable, but I guess they looked at the financials of the HOA and they, they didn't like them. I, I don't know. Uh, so yeah, I don't know. We'll see if we could still try to make the deal work. Yeah. Well, let me know. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, I appreciate it guys. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye.